Hello everybody, my name is Dr Lisa Riley and thank you so much, um, particularly to Jo, for allowing me to give you this lecture today. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person and I hope this video finds each and every one of you well in a very challenging time. So I'm a primatologist and a lecturer in animal welfare and um, I work at the University of Winchester just down the road. Today we're going to be discussing human wildlife conflict with a particular emphasis on how we as primates encroach on the life of other primates in the globe. So we'll be looking at what is a primate, also um, the conservation issues facing primates in the wild, but a particular issue close to my heart of the keeping of primates as pets. So if I may, first of all, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. And um, as I said before, I'm a primatologist and um, I've studied a variety of different species in a variety of both wild and captive contexts. So um, one of the main research projects that I have undertaken is working in a small forest reserve called Bodongo Forest in Uganda. Um, it's right near Murchison Falls, which is a tourist location in Uganda. And while I was there, I was lucky enough to study how chimpanzees particularly, but also how other primate species separate out along an ecological niche so that they can avoid competition for valuable fruit resources in a forest environment. So I was particularly interested in how chimpanzees, blue monkeys, red tail monkeys and black and white colobus will um, share different resources. As it turns out, chimpanzees being the biggest tend to monopolise all of the fruit resources in a forest. They love figs and um, if you have a ripe fig tree, then it will definitely be the chimpanzees that are utilising that resource. Once they're done and they've had enough, then all of the other monkeys can take their turn. In my travels, I've also studied different species in Bangladesh. Um, looking particularly for um, gibbon species, but also some of the macaque species out there. And I've worked as a primate keeper at Colchester Zoo. Um, it was quite short lived in comparison. Um, and I realised I really wanted to get back into academia and to study um, and make the lives of captive primates particularly a lot better. So along the way, I embarked on becoming a senior scientific officer at the RSPCA, and it was my particular job there to um, help the organisation try to deal with pet primate cases. And it's here that I learned the extent of the pet primate industry in the UK and the profound amount of suffering that goes along with that industry. And we'll speak about that a lot later on in the lecture. I've also done work um, with um, a brilliant chimpanzee organisation in Spain called the Mona Foundation and Mona rescues ex-photographer prop chimpanzees who have had a really abusive start to their life, often being um, drugged and beaten so that they are submissive and um, will quietly interact with tourists so that they can take photographs. I've been lucky enough to work with some really brilliant organisations like Twycross Zoo, Edinburgh Zoo and also Monkey World. Um, it's close by here and if you get the chance, then it's a really wonderful day out. But also um, it's an educational experience. You can really learn an awful lot about how we use and abuse primates around the world. So let's take a few minutes and just review the aims and objectives of today's lecture. First of all, it's really important that you understand what a primate actually is, but also how close we are related to primates in our own evolution. I think primates represent a particular case for welfare and conservation because they're so closely related to us. And really, sometimes you ask if we can't conserve and protect individuals who are closely related to us, then what chance is there to protect wider animal species? The second aim and objective is to understand the main threats to primates and primate survival in the wild. What are the leading factors that are causing population decline in wild living primates? We're going to consider a bit of the key research into um, primate human conflict. 
we're going to look at topics like deforestation and the bushmeat industry, but also the risks associated for both parties, humans and non-human primates, um, with diseases, for example, which is incredibly pertinent to the situation in which we find ourselves now. Um, hopefully by the end of the lesson, you will understand the direct relationship between wild populations and pet populations. Um, it's astonishing how many pet primates there are globally, um, and it is a problem in the UK as much as any other country, not just countries where we find wild primates. And we're going to relate this all together to discuss conservation as a potential solution to all of the problems that we see currently with wild populations and some captive populations. And hopefully we'll create a conservation strategy for a case study of the II, which I'll introduce in a bit. So um, it's really important that we understand what a primate is. And um, you'll see that I've added here um, a, a very um, sort of coarse scale family tree for the order of primates. Primates are a mammalian order and um, they are really very diverse. There's over 450 now species known to science. And the order is comprised of apes, of which we are part of this group. So if we were to add ourselves to this family tree, we would be in this category of apes. And we share the spot with chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas and orangutans. And um, according to different literature, we deviated from this family tree and a common ancestor of um, chimpanzees around about somewhere between four to eight million years ago. Um, it varies greatly in the literature. Um, we were not ever directly related to the chimpanzee that is extant today, so still alive today, um, but we shared a common ancestor and we branched off to become hominids or humans and the um, chimpanzee. And prior to that, um, gorillas then deviated from this common ancestor and about 13 million years ago, orangutans deviated from that same common, common ancestor. Other members of the group include monkeys. So all monkeys are primates, but not every primate is a monkey. So the primate could be a lemur, a lorisid member or a bush baby member. Um, it could be a monkey, old world or new world, but it could be an ape. So all monkeys are um, differentiated by where they live. Old world species are found in Africa and Asia, and new world species are found in South America. We have some specialised members of the primate um, family that rely more on their nose and smell. So olfactory communication is important to these guys. And they evolved many, many, many years ago. Um, they're tarsiers, lorisids, so that includes bush babies and um, the lorises, and lemurs. So lemurs are endemic just to the island of Madagascar. And you'll see that way down in um, the evolutionary history of primates, the lemurs deviated from that history very early when Madagascar was still part of mainland Africa. And in their island habitat, they have been um, subject to different selection pressures and lemurs have changed relatively little compared to other primates um, on their island of Madagascar. They represent a really interesting case study for evolution. But there are some common factors for the entire order of primates. The first, although it is disputed, is that all primates originated from a common ancestor, and that was the tree shrew, which is this little um, critter up here. So a small mammal, um, an arboreal mammal, one that was um, a diverse, active individual that would utilise a lot of dietary resources. And that's what we see in a lot of lemurs, lorises and the tarsiers today. All primates are classified as having a relatively large brain. And that's really interesting. And you might think, well, something as small as a tree shrew that could sit in your hand is obviously going to have a small brain compared to an enormous 300 uh, kilogram gorilla or something like that. But actually, if you control for body size, then all primates still have a larger than expected brain. 
So there is something about the cognitive development of primates that is unique to the entire order of primates. They also have five digits. So they have hands and feet and they have fingers and toes that have different functionality, much like ours do. So they don't have paws and they don't have um, like a, a hoof or anything like that. They actually have fingers and toes and hands and feet. That's really important and relates somewhat to their cognitive development or how big their brains are, um, because it involves up at the great eight level of the evolutionary tree, the use of tools. And we'll talk some more about that in a little while. They're classified as having a general um, GI tract, so gastrointestinal tract. But actually, some of the primate species have evolved to become specialised feeders. And we're going to look at one of the case studies of that um, later in this lecture. Most primates eat fruit. In fact, um, all of them do if they can get their hands on it. But fruit is a major component of most primate diets. So frugivory is one of the defining characteristics of being a primate. Being incredibly social is also part of being a primate. And it isn't just how many individuals you have in a family group or how many individuals you have in an entire community. For example, mandrills can live in communities or troops of up to 500 individuals in very dense forest undergrowth. The social um, structure of primate society can be incredibly complex. So old world monkeys, new world monkeys and apes, for example, um, as you get to this right hand side of the evolutionary tree, have increasingly complex social groups. They also have really complex social interactions. So primates will tactically deceive individuals and um, they will plan ahead. They will construct hunting parties, for example. They have incredibly political, diverse and complex interactions. And this goes in line with their big brain. One of the theories of why primates developed a big brain is to navigate social complexities of living in such diverse social groups. But it's the quality of the social interaction that we don't necessarily see in a lot of other species. So, for example, um, in baboon society, if an individual wants to mate with a female, then they have to be the lead individual. Only that lead male um, controls access usually to the females. So if you're a younger male, if you are a, a male lower down in the dominance um, hierarchy, then you have very few mating opportunities and you really want to be able to mate um, and have your genetic material preserved in your next generation. So um, it was first recorded by Andy Whiten and um, Professor Richard Byrne that some sneaky younger baboons will tactically deceive the older male. So they'll communicate to a female and sort of signal to her to go behind a rock. She waits behind a rock where um, she is then out of the view of the lead male. Because the lead male can't see um, that the female has gone and hidden herself, the younger male can sneakily go behind the rock, act like he's just foraging or um, going around his every, everyday business, but actually copulate with the female behind the rock while still looking to the male like he's not doing anything wrong. So this type of tactical deception is known as Machiavellian intelligence, and it's one of the defining characteristics of how complicated the social interactions of primates can be. Really interesting books by um, Richard Byrne, The Thinking Ape, which I believe is in your library, um, if you're interested in that even further. What else classifies as um, animals as being a primate? Well, they're incredibly long lived. They are slow to develop when they are born. They are born somewhat developed, um, but they still have a lot of brain growth to do once born. It's not like a rodent species that um, it is given birth to, develops incredibly quickly, matures quickly, reproduces quickly, and unfortunately for them, dies quickly. Primates have a much slower life history. 
they they the mothers that are pregnant for a long time they nurse or lactate for a long time it takes many years for an individual to grow to sexual maturity um, once they have reached sexual matu maturity then they are typically incredibly long-lived so they have a slow and protracted lifestyle So now we have an idea of what a primate is, let's consider where primates live. Because of their cognition and because they have at heart a basic GI tract, the same sort of GI tract as any mammal, they can exploit a lot of dietary resources and that means that they can inhabit a diverse range of environments. Apart from us, primates are one of the most widely distributed of all mammals. They live um, in extreme environments. So the Japanese macaque or snow monkey lives in incredibly cold environments. Primates are usually found in tropical areas, but this primate has evolved an extra thick coat. So it has more than double the hairs per um, cubic inch of skin compared to any other primate. But they have also developed this incredibly quirky behavior of sitting in natural thermal baths. So in the mountainous environment in which they're found, um, these natural springs are there and the primates have learned over time that they can get warm and exploit the warm water. And um, you can only do that, though, if you're part of the dominant group or if you're invited by one of the dominant individuals. So there's a lot of monkeys outside of this picture um, that are waiting on the periphery to take their turn and perhaps won't get to be that warm. Primates also live in savanna type land, um, often baboons, for example, incredibly adaptable primates. The food resource is very um, oddly distributed. So there is a wide distribution of resources, but they are incredibly spaced out. You have to travel to get them. And in your local vicinity, you have to start really exploiting any other resources you can get your hands on. So that's one of the reasons why baboons, for example, live in big groups, because they need the predation protection, but also so that they can find food. And when they do find food, they'll dig for food. Um, they would reuse tubers and roots that are carbohydrate rich, and um, they'll even eat the grasses as well. Primates can live in really high altitude environments. They can live in incredibly sheer and quite barren, rocky environments, in dense vegetation that is incredibly wet and humid, although no primate really likes to get wet, um, even to the point of orangutans and other ape species making themselves an umbrella. So they will fashion umbrellas out of big fronds and leaves like this and happily sit in them to avoid getting wet. But they also live on the forest edge environment. They don't have to be found densely in the forest area. They can be found on those peripheral areas and they would exploit the marginal forest environment then. So they can go deep into the forest and exploit resources there. They can live right on the periphery of the forest and, ex and um, exploit resources in this environment too. But within any of these environments, they also can exploit every part of that environment. So if we look at the picture of the savannah, it's not just the ground that they can exploit and the grassland, it will be the trees, it will be um, the dirt piles, it will be the rocks. Every aspect of that environment, primates try to exploit. So in this picture here, you can see the forest canopy is broken up. You have the understory, and the lower and middle levels and then the emergent level of the canopy right at the top and primates will distribute themselves throughout this environment so that they can avoid predation avoid competition from other primates but also so they can exploit so many more resources so they're highly adaptable in stark contrast to the previous slide where we looked at the natural environments now we can look at the urban environments of a lot of primate species. And this is the harsh reality of where a lot of primates live today. In our own environments, the built and manufactured human environment. As our population grows, 
then we become more and more urbanised. We flock to industrial areas that can provide us with food, education, healthcare. And the more people that are born or come into those areas, then the higher the population and the greater the need. So the area expands um, exponentially so in some countries. And we find that we build on prime conservation land. So forests are incredibly fertile. Um, and as we need to utilise resources, then we start to build upon those forests. We encroach somewhat then on the existing habitats of primates and those primates need to shift and adapt. They need to evolve and um, Darwinian evolution will say that an adaptive species will be a fit species and primates are adaptable. They have bodies that are adaptable, but also minds and cognitive function. That means they can problem solve, they can learn to exploit different resources, they can learn to navigate the harsh complexities of human based life. For example, we have a, a mother macaque here with her infant on her back crossing a really busy highway. They have to learn. They have no instinctual ability to understand what a car or a vehicle is, but they learn that there are potential dangers and how close that they can get to those vehicles safely. So they learn and adapt to navigate into that very different habitat type. And in the previous slide, um, we realised that primates are increasingly forced to live in an urbanised human led environment. And that's because humans are becoming ever more populous. And as we seek additional places to live, we come into almost constant human wildlife conflict. So the negative interactions between human populations and non human animal populations. This also could actually relate to an environment, um, not just one population of animals, but an environment as a whole. When humans are contained within an area, there is a distinct boundary between the humanised or urban environment and the other animal environment. There's a separation between the two and there is therefore a much wider conflict zone. So the conflict zone um, is almost large enough to mitigate some of the interaction and negativity between human and non-human animal populations. But as our population becomes more populous and um, we start to grow and encroach upon more of the natural environment, then that conflict zone overlaps the human boundary and the animal boundary. It brings us closer together with wildlife and it means that we are in conflict with wildlife so much more. They seem to impede the way that we want to live our life, perhaps even if it's a predatory species wanting to eat us, for example. Um, they seem to ruin some of the resources that we find valuable and therefore we start to devalue that animal um, and take very aversive action against those animal populations. Those never negative interactions are what classifies human wildlife conflict. So as our populations grow, then we know that we are going to come into conflict with other populations. And let's think for a while about some of the potential issues we might understand threaten the population of wild animals at the moment. Let's take 30 odd seconds just to think of some ideas. Hopefully you've had a chance to think of some and here are my ideas that we're going to discuss for the rest of this lesson. The first of all, um, human wildlife conflict is most notably discussed in terms of habitat destruction. So the loss of habitat leading to a conservation issue for certain um, populations of animals or even entire ecosystems. The, the habitat destruction that can occur can be absolute and total. 
but it doesn't always have to be. Um, not that it's really any better to the wildlife populations, but you can also get a fragmented habitat. So some of the habitat still remains. It isn't totally destroyed, but it is isolated and fragmented. So we'll talk about these um, examples in a lot more detail in the subsequent slides. So one of the main reasons why we would do that is so that we can feed ourselves and as I said before, forested environment, but also savanna environments are very productive environments to be in. A forest is naturally very diverse and there are a lot of useful resources in that environment on which humans can come to depend. But one of the reasons why um, people really highly regard that type of land is its soil productivity and fertility. So if you clear the forest of less useful crops, you can then plant en masse a monocrop that you can directly utilise as a food resource. And if you plant a readily available food resource in a primate um, or any other animal area or habitat, then you'll get crop raiding as a result of it. And this is a really front line type of human wildlife conflict. Um, the habitat destruction really doesn't lead um, most notably to one individual human pursuing another individual primate for retaliation, for example, but crop raiding certainly does. And we'll talk more about that later on. Bushmeat is an incredibly diverse and um, very worrying trend at the moment. It is still a problem and we'll see later that it is a problem even in this country. But also we need to think about um, less obvious causes of human wildlife conflict, including the disease risks and um, ecotourism, for example. It could be a great thing, but it can be a very detrimental thing. And it often brings people into direct contact with primates, which allows primate attacks um, and direct fighting between species to occur. And we'll look very lastly at one of the issues of the relationship between all of these different things leading to an increase of the keeping of primates as pets. Let's take um, a, a couple of examples of human wildlife conflict and look at them in far more detail. First of all, we'll start off with the major cause of population decline, which is habitat deforestation. And um, you'll see in the picture here, the, the destruction sorry, of the habitat is absolute. So this would be the pristine line of forest, and this is what it looks like after um, the forest has been cleared. On this other picture down here, you'll see how it's cleared. So often it's slash and burn. Um, so you just literally carve up all of the existing diversity and productivity of the forest. So you have a nice flat area in which you can then grow whatever crop you want to grow or have a settlement, for example, if you want to start living in the forest environment. The habitat loss is, is total. So um, there is complete destruction of the home ranges and territories of primate species. And it is extraordinarily quick to occur this doesn't just happen in um, host countries of, of primates. This happens on our doorstep also. And habitat deforestation is globally a major concern for the stability of the globe itself, of our own populations, and the sustainability of all of the ecosystems on, on the Earth. This really is um, one of the major concerns of our generation and your generation particularly. And the deforestation because of um, commercial gain from the deforestation happens at an alarming rate. So um, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, the net loss in global forest area during the 1990s was 94 million hectares. And that equated to 2.2 4% of all of the total forested areas of the globe. That's 4.5 Great Britons in total. And um, this was in the 1990s. We are ever more populous as a species and we are requiring ever more natural resources. So the rate is only increasing. Of course, there are initiatives to stop this going on, but in a 
country where there is economic instability and that has poor productivity and growth, so national growth, um, it's an easy and quick way to make money utilising the natural resources that your country has. And you could even argue that if your people are in poverty and your country is poor and in need, then you would have an obligation to make money and to improve growth, gross national product for your country. And utilising natural resources is one of the ways in which governments globally have typically um, increased their national productivity in terms of money and income. But why do people do this? Um, deforestation has occurred as long as humans have been around for natural reasons often. But for the human led deforestation, we want to log, we want to harvest timber and we are all reliant on a lot of um, wooden products. So our furniture, for example, um, is one of the biggest issues. Our demand for paper um, that obviously comes from trees, um, grazing land and to sustain farming activities. When we rear animals, they require a lot of space and a lot of nutrition to produce for us what we want them to produce. So that means we have to clear densely forested areas and make pasture land to graze those animals in. We want to exchange the diversity of the rainforest, for example, and grow one monocrop that we can live upon and sustains us. Um, for example, sugarcane, um, what I saw in Uganda was not local people um, destroying their local forest. It was British sugar as a conglomerate of businesses that were buying up the fringe environments around the forest and planting en masse sugarcane. And um, there are movements now within the industry to make that productivity far more sustainable. But if you're a poor farmer and um, an international company offers you a lot of money to plant sugarcane on your field and to chop down um, an area equivalent to your field next to it in the forest and grow sugarcane there, then most of us would say yes. So it's incredibly easy, and particularly with um, habitat destruction like this, to put the blame at other people's doors. But we really do have to globally take a look at the way that we seem to um, engulf resources and have this perpetual need to have new things, exciting new te technology, for example. Um, you can buy a really cheap sofa now for, for an example, and you wouldn't expect it to last long because you'll want a new one in two or three years time. And that puts an enormous strain on lots of other countries. Um, so it's a global issue and every one of us has a part to play. This doesn't just happen on the forests, the Atlantic rainforests in um, Brazil, for example, or the Congo or some far flung place. It's our responsibility and it's our Western demand often that causes mass scale habitat destruction. If you think of a local farmer, um, he'll take what he wants from the environment for his family, but he wants sustainability. And through other generations, he has learned that you selectively harvest from the forest. When um, just he or she is working independently to harvest from the forest, they'll go in on foot and they will have a literally a smaller footprint, um, a smaller effect on that environment. When you have a huge conglomerate and a commercial venture, they bulldoze an area, bring in heavy machinery, build a road that opens up previously inaccessible forests to the local community even further. And it cuts across lots of animal migration routes, but also their territory and home ranges. It just opens up and accelerates the rate of deforestation even further. The major issue with this is that it causes local extinction. It forces animals out of the environment. It pushes them to encroach upon our human based environments, just as we are encroaching upon theirs. And that directly leads to human wildlife conflict. 
closely related to um, habitat destruction is, is habitat fragmentation. So unlike the pictures before where you saw the total loss of a habitat, then habitat fragmentation takes what people want but leaves the rest. So um, essentially, from as the pictures demonstrate, you get this mosaic or patchwork effect of environments and habitat type. So once upon a time, all of this picture would have been the dark forested areas, but you can see the little mosaic of, of areas that are now gone to different uses, so that have been totally cleared of any of the natural vegetation that are being um, planted with monocrop, for example, leading to a lack of diversity and resource for the animals. But they will leave pocketed areas of fragmented forest particularly. Um, this area is seen as not so useful or difficult to get to. Maybe it's on a gradient and um, the machinery that is available can't deal with that. Maybe they've just cleared enough space and they will leave this purposefully for wildlife. But if you can imagine, if you're an arboreal primate, so you live um, right at the top of the emergent canopy, so right on the top of the tree line here, like, for example, a black and white colobus monkey would, you would rarely, if ever, come down to the ground. So it would be extremely difficult for you to leave this patch of forest and to travel confidently and knowingly to get to the next area of forest. So what habitat fragmentation does is leads to localised extinction. All of the habitat has gone, so you will get less animals being able to be sustained from that environment. But it also traps animals. And after a while, the effect builds up and up and up because you'll get localised inbreeding, a genetic bottleneck, for example, and an overall lack of diversity in the genetic potential of a population or species. So animals literally are trapped in these isolated pockets of their original habitat type. They can either try to adapt. Adaption should take a generation and these primates live a long time. That area of forest is not enough to sustain a troop of black and white colobus monkeys. It won't give them enough food resource. And within their generation, which could be 15 to 20 years, then there's too many animals living for too long to sustain in that environment. They will locally become extinct. We'll talk more about um, habitat fragmentation later on. And like I said at the beginning um, of this, when we started to look at um, different issues um, in conservation, we noted that there was habitat destruction and fragmentation and then crop raiding was quite closely related to that. One of the major reasons why we would start to exploit a natural resource is so we can clear the fertile land and produce a monocrop. Um, as the examples show you, um, we have a chimpanzee who has raided um, a plantation of pineapple and we have some lemurs, ring-tailed lemurs, that has, have um, raided a plantation of tea. So resources that we use in our own life um, that we would expect to find on our supermarket shelves that are being mass produced in different countries, um, we are taking our demand and our problem to the forefront of human wildlife conflict. As you can imagine, if you clear an area, it's your energy, your time, your resource, your money maybe to clear an, an area of forest and to grow your own crops. You want to protect those crops, you want to nurture them and have a good yield. And in some parts um, of, of very rural Africa, for example, and I certainly found this in Uganda, a lot of people still have small holdings and what they produce is what feeds their family. They have no money, they have no income, they have maybe a cow, maybe more likely a couple of goats, maybe some chickens and the area of land which they farm immediately around their house. It is their land, their profit, profitability and their future. It's what provides them with food and shelter and different resource. If you don't have that and your crops fail or they disappear somehow, then you don't have a way of feeding your family. And that might sound um, rather extreme but that is the truth of the situation it isn't like these people have um, a commercial venture just down the road like a localized tesco's that they can go shopping in if they don't grow it 
they don't eat. And it's as simple as that. So we re remove the natural resources, we plant a more profitable but far less diverse resource and we often plant really highly nutritious resources right next to a forested area for example and that simply pushes all of the animals out of the forest to get easy access to readily available nutrition. When I was in Uganda, um, I was talking to one of the conservation specialists at a sugar um, plantation run by British Sugar, and he was saying how annoyed he was that the animals seemed to deliberately come out to raid the sugarcane plantation. And I said, well, why wouldn't they? It is readily available. You literally walk up to the edge of the field, snap off the sugarcane, you suck the sugar cane it's really fibrous but if you chew it and suck upon it then it releases all the natural sugar chimpanzees love it the children love it human children love it on their way to school you see them walking down the road munching on their sugar cane closely followed by a chimpanzee that comes running out the crop plantation um, with a whole bundle of sugar cane it's readily available. It is really low energy to go and utilize the resource. So of course, that's what they do. But it has such grave consequences for the animals involved. People are fierce about protect protecting their crops. Animals are adaptable, particularly the primates, and they want to utilize that, that crop. It leads to a direct conflict between human and non-human species. So when that occurs, people tend to take very aversive action. They'll trap animals, they'll spear them, shoot them, poison them. Um, generally, they want to deter them. There isn't that much focus at that point on the sustainability of the animal's population or their conservation status, for example. And people go to great lengths at protecting their crops. For example, they guard it. Um, so they literally have dogs or themselves and they will guard night and day. Um, they'll take shifts upon it so that they can physically scare animals away from the crop. They will put fences around their crop. Then that has a really huge implication. If you have a really large fence that's difficult to get over or an electric fence that will directly harm or maybe kill the animal. And you have put that plantation right in the middle of a migratory route or even just um, the middle of the home range of a group of chimpanzees, for example, it's going to be a highly desirable area for the animals to get to, and it can really impinge their group dynamics. It causes the breakdown of entire communities of animals. It causes poor welfare for individual animals. It stops breeding routes, migratory routes. Um, it has a huge and profound effect on the population sustainability of that individual species. You can plant deterrent crops. A lot of people have tried um, planting chili, for example, um, around the outside of their plantations to try and deter animals, because if they eat the chili, the thought is that they won't like it and therefore um, they will leave the rest of the highly desirable crop alone. Um, that only works if your animal does not then start to like chili um, or start to find a way around it, like not eating those deterrent crops and just going straight through them to get to the crop that they really desire. And of course, we're talking about a very adaptable, cognitively complex group of species that very readily solve issues like deterrent crops. You might actually put a bank of preferred crop on the outside of a, a field or plantation to try and encourage the animals to just selectively forage on those preferred species of crop. That would then leave the commercial crop you want to grow intact and hopefully minimally disturbed by the animal. If we move on now to the bushmeat um, trade, this is really closely related again to um, crop raiding. When an animal crop raids, it loses some of its intrinsic value for the human society around it. Even if um, the people 
who live right near to these animal populations value seeing them and they get pleasure from seeing them, learning about them or sharing their usual everyday life with those species, it soon becomes a degraded problem when that animal crop breaks and when it has detriment to the profitability of um, growing crops in general. It might be that people are even displaced, like in times of civil war. If you have a civil war, lots of people take refuge from um, their current location and go into forested environments. It provides cover, but it also provides resource. And that's one of the reasons why we have such an issue with bushmeat trade now, because a lot of people were displaced in civil wars, particularly throughout Africa, and they learnt to utilise the meat available in the forest rather than the need to grow or produce um, animals from, from a farming um, industry. Bushmeat is incredibly popular. It is nutritious, it is cheap um, because you don't have to pay for it. Um, and if you lay traps, um, it could become readily available to you. And a lot of families will depend upon bushmeat um, for survival and for their sole source of meat protein. Actually, bushmeat, um, commercial bush, bushmeat is illegal and it is unsustainable. Small groups of people taking um, one animal to feed their family is sustainable um, nine times out of ten. But when it becomes a commercial venture and you start selling bushmeat at local markets to provide food for others, that's when it becomes a huge threat to the survival of particular species. Bushmeat is responsible for localised but also widespread um, extinctions, but conservation decline in population right the way throughout Asia and West Africa, but also throughout South America as well. One of the studies by, done by the Zoological Society of London, just to put this into context for you, found that 19 hunters in seven African sites hunted 2,000 carcasses a year. That is a huge number of animals that are being taken illegally. Not only is it a welfare issue, an animal rights issue, um, that these animals get hunted in that way, it is an inherent conservation concern. 19 hunters do not need to consume 2,000 carcasses a year. They are doing this for commercial venture and in an unsustainable way, whatever they come across, they will kill and they will consume or sell on for consumption. We see an increase in bushmeat use when um, we have commercialised um, habitat destruction or fragmentation. It's when people build roads into forests and open them up and make them more accessible that the bushmeat consumption skyrockets because while it would have taken you four or five hours of very hard laborious exercise to get into a forested area, very dense undergrowth, for example, um, before, when there's a road, it takes you perhaps 15, 20 minutes. Everything becomes far more accessible then, but it also, because the road goes right the way through the um, home ranges and territories of a lot of species, brings people into direct contact. So not only is it easier to get into the forest, it's easier to find the animals because the forest is now fragmented by a series of logging roads. So you can see that there's a real link between all of the different types of human wildlife conflict. And you might think, well, this is all an issue elsewhere, but it truly isn't. Um, a, a report several years ago found gorilla meat on sale in London just last year. There was a report that um, people in this country were eating endangered shark meat in restaurants. It is a genuine issue um, that affects all of us, not just people in Africa, in Asia or in South America. Bushmeat is directly related to a lot of disease transmission and we are currently living in um, COVID-19 times. And um, we suspect that the current outbreak of COVID-19 originated from a mutation of COVID virus that pangolin actually harbour. 
pangolins are one of the most illegally traded species in the world and really it was only a matter of time before some of their viral reservoir crossed the species boundary to infect our own species. And there are zoonotic diseases and anthrozoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases come from animals and they are given to us. Anthrozoonotic diseases are from us and given to other animals. And um, there are loads of them throughout history. There are multiple examples. The current day situation, um, civets that have been rumoured, I think, to spread the SARS virus, Ebola, um, Ebola has been known since 1976, and um, we knew that the death rate from Ebola was around 98% at the time. And we first discovered it in gorilla populations, and it would wipe out gorilla populations. Gorillas have been exposed to Ebola for a lot more years than what we have, and um, sometimes they build up a kind of natural immunity, although it is very rare. As people start to eat gorilla meat even more, um, then they come into contact with animals that carry Ebola. And it is that direct use of bushmeat that caused the um, outbreak of Ebola a couple of years ago. And um, if you pl plot the history of Ebola outbreaks, they usually lead back to some type of event um, where the population, human population, has increased or become in need and they have relied on bushmeat um, even further. So it's when our consumption of bush meat usually increases that we'll get disease prevalence. And um, some really interesting research done in 2010 found that tourists don't really even ask questions about diseases. They have no concept whatsoever that we could potentially pose a risk to other primate species and that other primate species pose a risk to us. If you're interested in um, zoonotic diseases and the risk of disease transmission, then um, here are a few of the diseases that you need to be aware of. Um, so polio that we are all vaccinated against is deadly to chimpanzees. And um, Jane Goodall, who I hope you've heard of, um, set up a Gombe Stream research station in the 1960s looking at chimpanzees and she was the first researcher to show that chimpanzees not only use tools but they make their own tools as well and her research and dedication to conserving um, chimpanzees has had a really profound effect around the globe but as they opened up the forest and people came into contact with chimpanzees other people um, were trying to exploit that research station. They went into the forest and one of them had polio um, and it almost ruined the population that Jane Goodall spent 20 odd years trying to habituate to her presence and study. The Gombe Stream um, Chimpanzee Research Facility is still going strong um, and has yielded now 50 odd years worth of data um, on how chimpanzees generally live their lives. Tuberculosis that we carry can also be deadly to a lot of species of primates. In fact, the herpes virus that we um, shed when we have a cold sore can be really deadly to a primate. In reciprocation, if you have simian, exposure to simian herpes B, then you, without treatment, have a 70 to 80% chance of dying yourself. And um, of course, HIV that we now understand came from simian IV, and it was most likely um, first brought into a human population, again, through the bushmeat trade and the consumption of chimpanzees and gorillas particularly. So there are also parasites that we share, um, bacteria that we share, of course, like um, tuberculosis. But um, it's a wide scale problem.